UHF RFID chips promise a lot and should overcome the two main shortcomings of standard RFID tags. A reader should be able to read a lot of tags in parallel and it should be able to read them over long distances. Where do you think this technology would be useful for your projects? Gritty YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent. With a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. In video number 223 and 235, we dealt with low frequency and high frequency RFID tags. These technologies allow only centimeters between the reader and the card. Suitable for many applications, but not sufficient for others. And we tried to read more than one tag at once and failed. There are more modern tags available, which have some anti-collision features, but they are not available for the average maker. This is why I spent $60 to buy a desktop UHF reader writer and a few tags. This is the cheapest entry into this new area. So it is clear from the beginning. This technology is more expensive than the other two. Here is the small reader and here a card. Here tags which look like tattoos and here tags which can be used during sports. UHF RFIDs work on the same frequencies like our beloved LoRa systems. In Europe on 865 to 868 MHz and in most other regions on 902 to 927 MHz. Not a good message for gateway owners, as we will see later. Especially in Europe, where the band is quite narrow. Let's start and check the promises. The reader has a USB connector and I got a demo program with it. First we have to decide which frequencies we want to use. For the moment I select the European band. I start with a range test. So this is the distance. This one here. I have to go closer and this one here I have to go very very close. Different tags have different ranges but overall it is quite frustrating. For sure we get a little bit more distance than with the conventional cards in the last videos where we nearly had to touch the reader but not meters as promised with the technology. We will have a closer look at this topic later on. Let's continue and check the next promise. Can it read many tags together? As said before, this could open up a bunch of applications. For example, I could scan my whole storage area to quickly find where I put a part or a device. Or we could count people in a sports event. Or we could, as discussed in the last video, stick tags to all our belongings and check at the front door before we leave if we have everything packed. This would be a cool application I think. Let's check the storage scenario with my humble reader. I put a tag in one box and I want to know in which it is. I move the reader across the boxes and find it quite fast without opening a box. But what happens if I have more than one part in the box? It reads most of them. The problem here is the lack of range and that the tags are very close together. I had to keep them together because otherwise the distance gets too big. So without opening the boxes we can locate a particular device. Cool. For sure this would help my old brains. So this promise is kept. We can detect many tags together if they do not entirely overlap. This technology definitely has potential, but we have to solve the distance problem. Why does this reader only bridge a few centimeters? We are makers and such a situation, of course, is a challenge. To start, we have to understand how these tags work. Each RFID tag consists of a tiny chip and an antenna. If you want to know how these are made, you can watch the video of Strange Parts. I leave a link in the description. He tried to build one himself. And there is no battery in the tag. It is entirely passive and the power for the chip comes over the air. 
we need enough power to switch the processor in the chip on. It then starts to change the signals from the reader. If it wants to transmit a 1, it tries not to reflect any energy back to the reader. If it wants to transmit a 0, it reflects as much as it can. Like that, the reader can read the message. The reader, therefore, has to send a signal and at the same time listen to a much weaker signal on the same frequency. Not a simple task. The first task is to get enough energy to the tag to power the chip. The second challenge is to get enough energy back to the receiver that it can read the signal. It seems that the processor cannot be powered by this small reader if the distance is longer than a few centimeters. And if the processor is off, it does not reflect any information. This is very digital, either enough power or not. How much power does our box produce? To find this out, we have to have a connection to the transmitter. Let's have a look inside the device. Maybe we can do something. You never know. I already took the four screws off and after opening, we see that it contains two parts the electronics and the PCB antenna. And the antenna is made that we can take it off and solder an SMA connector at its place. That's precisely what I was hoping for. Like that, we can do some measurements and, more importantly, connect bigger antennas to the device. Maybe with a good antenna, we can increase the power. As usual, we connect the device to the spectrum analyzer to see how the signal behaves. It moves all over the place and disturbs the whole band. And it seems to be always on. A fascinating concept if we remember that with LoRa we are only allowed to transmit 1% of the time on the same frequency. The reason for that is that this technology would absolutely not work with this 1% limitation. Bizarre laws indeed. And of course, a device in the vicinity of a LoRa gateway spams it completely. Military persons would call that electronic warfare. The output power of the box is selectable up to 13 dBm, which is 20 mW. Our LoRa modules should be able to produce 20 dBm. And with this power, I was able to bridge 200 km. But here, it's only suitable for a few centimeters. Why that? Because a receiver needs much less energy to decode a signal. LoRa modules just need minus 148 dBm to detect a signal, which is much, much less. Even a low power processor like the NRF52832 needs 0.7 microampere in deep sleep, which is 1400 billion times more power and only for sleeping. Do you see the difference? Summarized, our reader has to have lots of power. I constrain it to only one frequency to measure the peak power. We see that it has much less power than our LoRa modules. They were at plus 15 dBm. So apparently, here is the problem. If we want to bridge a longer distance, we need more power. And from Joule, we know that power is reduced with the square of the distance. If we want to bridge 10 meters instead of 10 centimeters, we need 10,000 or 40 dB more power. There are two ways of getting more power. Stronger transmitters and better antennas. I do not have a stronger transmitter, but I have bigger antennas. And since we have an SMA connector, we can connect them. Let's start with the last collinear from my mailbag and test the distance. It is disappointing. The distance is not long at all and it varies with the position of our tag. If you watch the video of Strange Parts, you see that there are two modes of transmission for these tags, near and far field. And we are clearly in the near field here. The far field energy is too small to power the tag. But a long time ago, I bought a Yagi antenna for this frequency range and forgot about it. This is a perfect test for such a very directional antenna. Let's mount it and do some testing. We see the directional effect 
if we use our spectrum analyzer as a receiver. If we point a Yagi directly to the antenna of the spectrum analyzer, we see a signal. It disappears if we turn the antenna away, as expected. Now we test with a tag. Also, no success. Even less, we also do not get a near field effect. Very strange and extremely disappointing. We know that we cannot trust the Chinese antennas. Let's quickly test if the antenna works in the frequency range we need. The small vector network analyzer shows the ugly truth. It is completely unusable. The VSWR at 900 MHz and below cannot be displayed by the device because it is more than 50, which means that only 5% of the power goes into the antenna and the rest is reflected back to the reader. Naming this piece of metal antenna is hugely exaggerated. It will immediately disappear from my lab. Once more wasted money for a Chinese antenna. I'm happy I got this small vector network analyzer. So we had one success. We were able to read 15 tags together. That is very important. If you present two tags to a high frequency reader, it already creates an error message. For the distance, we know what we have to do. Buy a bigger reader with more power and a better antenna. They are available, but not cheap. This is why I want to thank all my supporters on Patreon and viewers using my links for their purchases. Without you, it would be difficult for me to do what I do now. Bye.